Hey, just so you know, in honor of Mother's Day, we're going to continue our series in Philippians. <laughs> because I believe, without beyond a shadow of a doubt, that uh, every mother wants their child to hear a sermon like this one today about rejoicing and peace that comes from the Lord. So, anyway, we are in our series in Philippians. Um, I do wish all the mothers out there a happy Mother's Day for those that have lost a mother or uh, are suffering because of infertility, let, let me say to you, I am prayerful and considerate of that. I know the pain that comes with it, uh, and, and I just want you to know that I am grateful that even in the midst of darkness, the Lord gives us reason to rejoice, and so there's even something here today for you. So, all right, uh, back to Philippians. We're, we're in our series. We're in the last chapter. We're going to be in chapter four uh, of that, and um, Paul is really just giving some last minute, almost bullet point style instruction or commands to the church to live and uh, act a certain way as a result of the fact that they are in Christ. And so, so, so that's what he's doing. And as a result of the way this passage is written, we, there, there's a context that we are stepping into that I just want us to have a, a measure of what's happening because the commands we're going to study today are rooted in an overarching command to stand firm in the Lord. And so we're going to pick up and, and read what we studied last week before we get to our, our uh, focal passage for today. Uh, and so just as we do that, let me just go ahead and pray so that we can pray, ask his guidance, we can read. I'm going to interrupt in the middle of that. And I just want us to have had a time to just sit in front of his word and, and just recognize this is his word to us. What, what a gift we've been given. So, so Father, help us now, I pray. Uh, as I just said, this is your word. This, this is your revelation of yourself and, and your intent for us uh, in life. Uh, it gives life. It gives power. It enables us to, to know you, to know how you would have us live, and it even conforms us and transforms our hearts to, to live that way. So, so help us now, I pray. Um, be confronted as is necessary so that we can repent. Be encouraged to, to have faith and to just... To, to see Christ as sufficient and a, a, a great treasure, um, and then even a desire to stand firm in him. Help us now, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So here we are, Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, my brothers, this is a whole Christian family, therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown. You can hear his affection for them. His love is just it, it's thick and rich. Whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm. This first imperative, this first command, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Yodia and Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. The only path in this life to, re to rejoicing together in the church is standing firm in and agreeing in the Lord. That was the main point from last Sunday. The only path in this life to rejoicing together in the church is standing firm in and agreeing in the Lord. Stand firm. Don't give up any ground. Hold true to what we have attained. This is a, this is a theme that has run all the way through uh, this, this letter. As much as this letter is about joy and and the theme of joy and the theme of unity, it is a, a theme that is clear and a thread that runs all the way through is endurance, perseverance, not giving up, hanging on, pressing forward. Uh, as he says in uh, chapter 3, that I press on toward the, call of the up, or toward the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He presses on, pushes forward, doesn't give up any ground. This first application that comes from this, this command to stand firm is to agree together. It's about Christian unity. It's, it's only possible when we agree in the Lord and when we trust him, when we value him, when we keep our eyes on him, when we follow after Jesus, unity and the community that's developed out of that unity is the fruit of that. So often we think, oh, I've got to arrive at unity. I've got to stand firm in unity. I've got to, I've got to achieve unity. We don't do that. It, it, and I used this illustration last week, if, 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 if we determine that we're going to stand firm in unity, 
And it's based off of each of our own perspectives. We're going to end up defining unity based on our own individualistic perspectives. And so what unity are we going to stand in? Yours? Yours? Mine? No. He's saying, agree in the Lord. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And so, so we, we heard that quote from A.W. Tozer that every piano that's tuned to the same fork is in tune with each other. We don't need to tune pianos to each other. We tune pianos to a fork and they're all tuned to, to, together. And that's the... That's what Christ does for his church. As we look at him, as we keep our eyes on him, as we stand firm in him and agree in him, unity is the byproduct. It's the fruit of that. And where unity is not, the, 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 then the reality is it's because we aren't agreeing in the Lord. And Yodia and Syntyche are the, are the primary example of that in this church. Now, probably there was other issues in the church. But that's clearly one he calls out. But here's the thing. It, 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 but, but, but part of getting to this place where we stand firm and agree in the Lord, there's uh, some other undergirding truths that we need to get to. And he's going to deal with those in these coming verses. See, we don't only find Christian union as a result of looking at Jesus. We also find joy and peace. And that peace and that joy that that we're able to have together is part of, or it's part of what we celebrate as, as, as brothers and sisters in Christ. So this is where Paul turns next. So we keep reading verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And I just want to stop. I want to point out the in the Lord. Stand firm in the Lord, he called us in verse 1. In verse 2, to, to entreat Yodia and Syntyche, agree in the Lord. And now, even as he commands and calls us to rejoice, rejoice in the Lord when always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Over and over and over, every command, every instruction, every promise that's made in these passages is rooted in our connection to the Lord. Stand firm in Him, agree in Him, rejoice in Him. What, what, what Paul is really calling the church to do is practice what the Lord has produced in them, the, the result of their life in the Lord is to be put into practice. It, it's to be evidenced in their lifestyle. It's to be exemplified by them as a people, not just a few individuals. He's not just telling them to do something out of left field. He's calling them to do the very things that the gospel has produced in them. Live joyfully and at peace. Live together as a, as a united body. This sounds great. I, I, think, I, I think truthfully, if, if we were to do a survey, I, I think truthfully we all want to live at joy and in peace. In fact, I think that's a common theme, not just in people in the church. I think that's a common theme across all American people and probably the world. I, I think when we meet people that just enjoy drama and, and difficulty and hardship and they just love being sad, I, I think when we meet those kind of people, we recognize something's off. Right? If someone's perpetually angry, perpetually anxious, perpetually sad, we recognize that there's something off. The, the reality is, I think, I th- I think this is all something we, we can identify. We want this. We all want this. But there's really only one place to find it. We know life is difficult. We know that, that hardships come and Oftentimes, circumstances are overwhelming. We, we know that, like the weather, there's always a storm coming. I, I, I woke up this morning, and, and it was nice and sunny yesterday. And I woke up this morning, I heard the wind blowing like crazy outside the house. I was sitting in my office, and there's this big thud against the house. And it made me jump. It was so loud, and I didn't know what it was. So I get up, and I go look, and the wind is blowing so hard, it's blown over a uh, like one of those yard umbrella things. I don't know what you call that. An umbrella. Blown it over against the house. And, and I think it was supposed to be sunny today. I assume it's still going to be sunny today. But it seemed like a storm was coming. Because that's what happens in Springfield 
in the spring, they tell you it's going to be sunny and then it storms. That's just what happens. We know that in life. The weather tells us there's always a storm coming, just like the waves on the ocean. One wave hits, you know, you might get a period of, of rest, but the next wave is coming. And he's saying, don't draw on your own strength. Don't draw on your own power. Stand firm in the Lord so that you can rejoice in the Lord. Don't trust in yourself. Don't, don't, don't stand on your own. Trust in him. Draw from him. The only path in this life to knowing the joy and peace promised in the gospel is found in the Lord of the gospel. The only path in this life to knowing the joy and peace promised in the gospel is found in the Lord of the gospel. Everywhere we turn, our, our world is overwhelmed by depression and anxiety. Our, our country um, is, I, I think, at unprecedented rates dealing with depression and anxiety. Now, there's a lot of theories about why this is. In fact, I'll probably another. If we, if we walked around here and listened to a bunch of different theories, a bunch of different ideas, there's probably a number of theories to why that is. During the pandemic, there, there's research that says that it went from 11% of adults in the United States talking about um, uh, d- reporting symptoms of anxiety and depression or depression and anxiety. I don't know which one's supposed to go first, but reporting 11, 11% of adults reporting this. It went during the pandemic, in, at the beginning of the pandemic in 2020, 11%. In the height of the pandemic, in the midst of 2021, 42% of adults in the U.S., reporting symptoms of depression and anxiety. That's probably not surprising to anybody. Again, we could talk about all the reasons why. That's probably multifaceted. Media, governmental handling of the pandemic, other crises we, fa- crises we faced in the midst of the pandemic. But I think the truth is there's one undergirding reason, one, one reason that sums them all up. The vast majority of Americans aren't standing firm in the Lord. That's our problem. If we're to be serious about it, yeah, the media has a contributing factor. Yeah, the, the way the government ha, ha, de- deals with the pandemic, ha, yeah, yeah, that has a part to do with it. Um, and, and that's whether you agree or disagree, the way other people talked about the pandemic, right? All the other crises, racism, uh, all, all the, the, the election, all those things, they, they might have a part to play. But those storms are always raging in one way or another. The reason we struggle with joy and peace is standing firm in the Lord. Now, as I say that, I need to make a I I need to I need to make a caveat, and I need need to say something here. As we talk about these things today, I don't want you to hear me saying, especially in something I just said, that if you're depressed or struggling with anxiety, that you aren't standing firm in the Lord at all. I don't want you to hear me say, if you're taking medicine to help you ma- manage depression and anxiety, anxiety, that you are somehow less Christian. The truth is that mature Christians throughout history have also struggled with depression and anxiety. I, I, one, notable, one notable example is Charles Spurgeon. He's one of the most influential pastors of his day and remains nearly as influential today. And his, he, he struggled a lifelong struggle against depression in one of his sermons titled the christian's heaviness and rejoicing he says this i didn't put this quote on the screen it's not part of the sermon it's just i want to illustrate this point a, a mature christian that had been preaching for a number of year, number of years following the lord we would suggest is mature in his faith writes these words my spirits were sunken so low that i would weep by the hour like a child and yet i knew not what i wept for just carrying the heaviness of life, dealing with deep depression. And it, and it would be nice to be able to say, oh, this was years and years previous, and that he, was, he, 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 he had grown past that, and, and that he no longer dealt with that, that he came to faith, and all of a sudden the sun shined, and the weight went away, and the hardship was over. It was the week before he preached that sermon that he was referring to. He laid on his couch and he wept like a child and he couldn't tell you the reason for his weeping. He just was depressed. Our brains and our bodies are filled with organs that are affected by the fall, by our fall into sin. Now, just just, just like our bodies fail, so can our minds. It's wrong to say that if you have enough faith, you won't get the flu or cancer 
or injure yourself in some way. And it's wrong to say, it is equally wrong to say, if you have enough faith, you will never be depressed and you will never be anxious. Or it's just as equally wrong to say you are only dealing with anxiety or depression because your faith is weak. On both counts, whether you're talking about your physical body or your mind, that is health and wealth rubbish. Scubalon is the word that Paul used in Philippians chapter 3. Rubbish. Oh, I'd love to use the stronger language, but I'm not going to. It's prosperity gospel mumbo jumbo. Our faith does not remove the heaviness of life. It gives us an object in which we find strength in the midst of hardships in life. In the same way that antibiotics and modern medicine won't won't make you live forever, the pills prescribed to deal with depression and anxiety, you need to hear this, will never actually give you the joy and the peace that you so long for. So we don't want to dismiss it. I don't want to dismiss the real struggle of depression and anxiety. But ultimately, there really is truly only one solution. Take the medicine to find relief. But in the midst of taking the medicine, you make sure you focus your mind on the truth and you stand firm in the Lord and so that you can rejoice in the Lord. The only path in this life to knowing the joy and peace promised in the gospel is found in the Lord of the gospel. The, the, the gospel is a message of joy and peace. And, 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 and that's why Paul is able to even come down and say these things. Rejoice in the Lord always. And, and, and your hearts will be guarded. Your, your mind and your hearts will be guarded by the peace of God. Which surpasses all understanding. The gospel is a message of peace and joy. It, it literally is defined as, as good news. And imagine it, if, if the good news that we, that we proclaimed was Jesus died for your sins. He lived a perfect life. He died for your sins and, and rose victorious over resurrection, but it had no meaning for you. Is that good news? Nobody's going to benefit from it. No fruit in life. No, no hope. No, no joy. No peace. He just did it, just to show he could. That's not good news. Good news is that he came and he lived a perfect life where we couldn't. He did what we couldn't do. He died a sacrificial place in our place for our sin. And he rose victorious over death. And that brings us joy and peace, not an eternity of depression and anxiety, that's good news. Because there's no, no, no matter how deep the pit, no matter how dark the night, there's always the light of morning. The dawn is dawning. Let me just show you some of this. So I, just wanna, I don't want this to be about what Seth said. I want you to see this in the scripture. The good news is a message of joy and peace. Luke chapter 2, verses 10 through 14. The angel said to them, this is the, the shepherds are are gathered out with their flocks at night. And the angel appears and they're sore afraid, right? And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of what? Great joy. Something to celebrate, something to fill you with, with, with happiness and pleasure and satisfaction. Great joy that will be for all people, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, li- lying in a manger. And suddenly, suddenly, there was a, w- with the angel, a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest. And on earth, what? Peace among those with whom he is pleased. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, all the way back, not only were the angels proclaiming before his birth or at the time of his birth, all the way back 700 years before he was born, Isaiah prophesies, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, will, there will be no end. Just consider what that means. 
What starts to be peace with him will increase in peace until there's only peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. From before he was born to the moment of his birth to after his death and resurrection, John 14, 27, peace I leave with you. He meets with his, or this is just before his death, I'm sorry. John 14, he's gathered with his disciples Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. These people, he's about to be arrested. He's about to be condemned. He's about to be crucified. And he says, peace. Have my peace. John 15, 11, just a few paragraphs later, just a few moments later, in this whole teach session of teaching, Jesus says to them, These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Have you ever considered that, that not only did he want you to have eternal life, that he wanted that eternal life to be marked by his joy and his peace? This is the good news. This is the work that Jesus came to accomplish after his resurrection. John 20, 19 through 21. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Shalom. Peace. My peace be with you. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. They rejoiced. They were happy. They were celebrating. They were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you from beginning to end, even before the, before the day he was born, pronounced by the prophets and the angels, to the day he was crucified, to the day of his resurrection. And the, and, and the first time all of his disciples saw him together, he is about joy and peace. And the joy and peace of his people. Paul is calling us to this, not to put on something that isn't already supplied, but to, but to practice what has been and is intended to be produced by the gospel message. The good news of the gospel is that in Christ we can rejoice and we can know peace. Even now in the deepest of pits and the darkest of nights, we know that the dawn is breaking. And there's always light over the horizon. This is the only path to look at the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. I, I, I want you to see that everything we're going to go through today is always rooted in Him. His presence with us. His guarding of us. It's rooted in Him. And so let's look at these commands and look at these promises. In the Lord, we always have reason to rejoice so we always can, we can always rejoice. In the Lord, we always have reason to rejoice. So we can always rejoice. Look at verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. He doesn't say when it feels right or when it feels good or when circumstances are right. He doesn't tell them, hey, when, when Yodia and Syntyche finally decide to get along, then rejoice. Rejoice now. Rejoice always. Rejoice then. Rejoice when? Always. Again, I will say rejoice. And he is so clear. He, 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 he's so cons uh, uh, persistent about this. He's so committed to this that he doesn't just say it once. He says it twice. And where does he say that we find this source of joy? It is in the Lord. So we rejoice in him. We don't rejoice in sin. We don't rejoice in injustice. We don't rejoice in the many reasons for mourning. There are plenty of them. Tomorrow morning, I'll be, you, many of you saw the, the, statement, the, the post on Realm about uh, Macy's uh, sister who passed away last week. Sunday, she's sitting here in church. She goes home. She finds out that her sister has passed. I'll be at her funeral tomorrow doing, doing the funeral. And we walk into the middle of that and flippantly say, hey, why aren't you rejoicing? Why aren't you clapping your hands and cheering for joy and dancing? Or do we recognize that this is the right time to mourn? We have a right way to mourn. We mourn as, with, as, as a people with hope. It's right to mourn death, right? 
But as, as Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that we're to do that as a people with hope. He tells us in Romans 12, 15, that there is a time to weep. And when we meet people who are weeping, we should weep with those who weep. But there's another part of that verse as well. In fact, it comes first. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. And there's a right season for these things and a right way to handle them. Paul didn't rejoice because he was afflicted by those who were preaching Christ out of selfishness and, and envy or seeking to afflict him. He didn't rejoice because there were people who were opposed to him. He didn't rejoice because of that. Why did he rejoice in the first chapters of Philippians? Because Christ was proclaimed. Paul didn't rejoice that he was in prison, but he still prayed in joy and gratitude because of his partnership with the Philippians. So we don't rejoice in sin. We don't see someone sinning and say, Woohoo, God's grace is sufficient. We might say God's grace is sufficient, but sin is sin. We should not be happy to leave someone in sin. We don't rejoice in injustice when a drunk driver kills an innocent family. We don't get up and dance. We don't rejoice in things to be mourned, but we do rejoice in the Lord. And because the Lord has done what He's done by living a perfect life, dying a sacrificial death and raising in victory, now sitting on the throne, interceding for us at the right hand of the Father, we always have a reason to rejoice. No matter how dark the night is, His mercies are new every morning. Rejoice. No matter how deep the pit is, there's still one that stepped down into the pit to bring us up out. To set us up on a rock. To pull us out of the miry clay and put us on the rock. He's done that work. He's overcome and, and, and even as he spoke with his disciples, it was, hey, you're going to suffer. People are going to hate you because of me. Hardship is coming your way. But take heart. I have overcome. In him, we have the greatest treasure. In, in, in him, everything else in comparison to the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus is rubbish. And so long as we have him, if we lose everything else, we have reason to rejoice. In him, we have been made righteous, not by a, a work of our own, but by faith in him and his righteousness. And by doing so, we have reason to rejoice. In him, we have the hope of his resurrection. Death no longer has any power over us. Death, oh death, where is your sting? It doesn't exist to us anymore. Death is not the worst thing that can happen to us anymore. It's in Him that we have the hope of eternal life, and so we always have reason to rejoice. In Him we have nothing to lose, because in Him even our hardships are victory. And this is why Paul could say to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Because he had Christ. Because we have Christ, we always have reason to rejoice, and so we can always And should always seek to rejoice. Look at verse 5. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. I think this is a direct result of us finding, uh, always keeping our eye on the Lord, standing firm in the Lord, rejoicing in the Lord. I think it's a direct result of that. I think it's connected to it. I think that, that, that flow of thought. Because the Lord is always near, we should act reasonably toward all people. So the idea of meeting people and those who weep, we weep with them. Those who rejoice, we rejoice with them. We act reasonably towards all people. But, but the, notice, it, Paul doesn't say, hey, um, let your reasonableness be known because people are reasonable or circumstances are reasonable. Why does he say it? Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Because the Lord is always near, we should act reasonably toward all people. We can act reasonably toward all people. We should act reasonably toward all people. Now, now this Lord is at hand. It could be a reference to, it could be a reference to his imminent return. So the first century church, the, the New Testament church, they were convinced they lived as if at any moment Jesus could return. I think that's something we've lost in time. We've kind of got regulated and normalized in this idea that, oh, maybe it's just a long ways off because it's been a long ways off. 
I think in some ways, I, I don't think that means that we should go prepping, and I'm not in, in encouraging you to start carrying sandwich boards and going downtown. The, the Lord is coming. The end is near. So I, that's not what I'm after, but, but living our lives as if, if at any moment the Lord could be here. I think that's the right way for us to approach this. But the second way, another way that this could be considered is that this Lord is at hand is that it could be a reference to his always being with us. As in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, you know, the Great Commission. Uh, Therefore, go make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. And I am with you always to the end of the age. So the idea that he's always with us or could be both. I think probably the most plausible thing is Paul has both in mind. The Lord is always with us, and he is at hand, and he could return at any moment. Well, so let's be reasonable, because the Lord is at hand. Well, what does that mean? The best description or definition I came across was from Spurgeon, and I just thought I'd share his words with you. I really appreciated them. The the best translation, he writes this, the best translation would probably be forbearance. Do not get angry with anybody. Do not begin to get fiery and impetuous. Do not push your own rights too far. Whew, that's not, he's got to be British. Can't be American. Stop short of what you might fairly demand. Stepping on my toes now. And when you feel at any time a little vehement in temper, check yourself. Hold yourself in, bear and forbear. Go not as far as you may, not even as far as, you, as some think you ought in defending your own rights. Let your gentleness, your yieldingness be known unto all men. And I'm not lying. I'm not being silly. That hits home. Because oftentimes my knee-jerk reaction to a circumstance or situation is, who are you to tell me? Or who are you to impede upon what I believe I'm do but suddenly flying in the face of what comes natural to me i am called to rejoice in the lord so much to find such joy and satisfaction and pleasure in the fact that i have christ that i never have to argue and win another argument again that if all my rights are removed i'm still free to worship the lord That if chaos reigns, I can still have peace in Him. That I can be steady. And being taken advantage of doesn't really remove anything from me. Because I've been given more than I could ever fathom in the treasure of knowing and living with and having the hope of eternal life with Jesus. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. I mean, I'm just going to ask, over those last couple of years, when life has been at boiling, have we really been reasonable? When we're arguing over the things that we've argued at, over this last couple of years, has it been out of reasonableness or out of defense of self? Has it been rooted in the joy that we have in Christ or is it rooted in trying to maintain joy and comfort for myself? I, I would suggest the only reason we're able to, to know this reasonableness, this forbearing because our joy is in the Lord and we are standing firm in Him, understanding that He is with us. But said a a slightly different way from another perspective, if, if we aren't able to live reasonably and demonstrate our forbearance to everyone, it might just be because we aren't standing firm in Him and recognizing the Lord is at hand and that in Him we have reason to joy rejoice no matter how dark the night or deep the pit but because we're seeking joy and satisfaction in something other than Him, in some other source than Him. 
Because the Lord is near, we should. We are right to act reasonably toward all people. Because the Lord is near, verse 6, because the Lord is near, we should always pray gratefully instead of anxiously. Look at it. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. The Lord is at hand. Doesn't just serve as the reason for Paul to say, let us be reasonable, but it also serves as the, as the reason for which we should pray. The Lord is at hand. So rather than running in anxiety and dissatisfaction, turn to Him in grateful prayers. Instead of being anxious about anything and everything, instead of being anxious about every circumstance and season we face, he says, pray. Instead of running around trying to build our own kingdoms and gather as much stuff as we possibly can and get our hands on and the, the one with the most toys wins kind of ideas, celebrate what we have in him. And so we run to prayer. Rather than running to prayer and then persisting in prayer because we need to get more from God, we pray gratefully. I just want you to consider this for a moment because what he's saying is pray knowing that you've already been, that all of your requests and your needs have been satisfied some way that maybe you're not even thinking about yet. Pray gratefully. Pray with thanksgiving. He set the example already for us in the, in the beginning of Philippians when he says, I, every time I remember you, I give thanks. Because he is so satisfied and I pray with joy. That's the example. See, many of us, we run to prayer when we don't think we have what we need. We run to prayer and we persist in prayer over the things that we think God must give us. I'm not suggesting, I don't want you to hear me suggest that you shouldn't recognize need and carry those needs to the throne. That's what Paul says. But pray as if you know. The Lord will answer. Maybe not in the way you want, but in the way He knows best. He will give you everything He knows is good for you. He will give you, I think it was Tim Keller I heard say this one time, He will give you everything you would have asked for if you know what He knew. We're running so hard after the things we think he needs to give us. We persist in prayer over those things. Paul's saying pray gratefully, knowing he is going to take care of his children. Rather than running to prayer and persisting in prayer due to fear and uncertainty, we can pray with gratitude because we have him. And we know the antidote to anxiety is prayer and trusting the one to whom you pray. Jason Meyer, a commentator I'm reading from, uh, ESV expository commentary is a really good one. Um, He writes, we do not make our requests known to God because God lacks knowledge of them. We make our requests known so that we may be free from anxiety. I don't want to give you permission to be anxious. That's not because he's already said, don't be anxious. He's going to say, don't be anxious, right? He's already said, don't be anxious. I don't want to give you permission to be anxious. But if you find yourself anxious, he's given us a solution. Pray. Pray how? Pray gratefully. Pray faithfully. Pray trusting that God is going to work. Now, oftentimes we'll say, oh, the reason for prayer is so that God can conform us to his his will, that, that we can see God working in response to our prayers. But here Paul gives us another reason for us to pray so that we no longer have to endure in anxiety. If we feel anxious, the answer is not inform God of what's going on because he doesn't know. It's to seek God's will to work in your circumstance so that you can trust it will be taken care of. That you can place your faith in one who has power to do what you can't do. To to turn your attention to one who has affection for you, for which he has sent his son and died on a cross and, and, and then rose from the dead, giving you the hope of eternal life. To turn your attention to the one who is always working for your good. No, I know. I know that it seems like I'm oversimplifying this whole thing. I, I'd never dealt with anxiety up until about four or five years ago. I mean, you know, the common everyday little, uh, what's going to happen if what's... 
But it was never debilitating. It was never a struggle. It just was, you know, it's just there. I don't even really worry about stuff. I'm usually pretty optimistic in things. And <clears throat> but a season, uh, it's about five or six, I don't know how many years ago it was. You know I'm calendar challenged, but I'm str- I struggled. There was, there was a season where there was an impending doom for which I can't even tell you the end of the doom was. I just knew it's bad. This looming doom, and it's coming any time, and it got so bad at times that if I, um, if I sat quiet for too long, especially laying in bed trying to go to sleep at night, this pressure would build in my chest. The, to the point that there was a couple of nights I thought I might be having a heart attack, and I didn't wake Amy up. I didn't want to worry her. I was really pretty convinced it was just this anxiety that I was dealing with. It got so bad that there was a Sunday I came here. I had written a sermon that I know needed to be preached, but I had no desire to preach, that I really wanted to stand up here, give my resignation, walk out. Amy was sitting on the aisle just like she is now. I think that's your place, isn't it? Close to that, because I remember you sitting there. I wanted to tell you I quit. I'm done. Walk out, grab her, leave, and never look back. Because I just knew everything was falling apart. I knew everyone was against us. I knew all these lies that, that weren't true seemed so true and so real, and they were crushing me. I can tell you that I pray. I preach the gospel to myself. God is good. 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 I can't tell you how many times I told myself driving down the road, God is good. God is good. God is good. He is good. For you, he is not against you. His grace is sufficient in your weakness. His power is made perfect in weakness, right? I'm preaching this to myself regularly, and I can't stop this pressure. I'm praying. I'm asking others to pray. And I can tell you, I am certain if it weren't for prayer, I wouldn't be standing here today. That Sunday... That Sunday, as I stood here, I knew that even as I prayed, my eyes weren't on him. My eyes were on the solution that I knew he needed to work out for me. I I knew that as I preached the gospel to myself, I I believed it, but I wasn't believing it. I had been scheduled I had been scheduled a couple weeks earlier to go on a solitude retreat. It's not something I like to do, it's something I need to do, and so it was something I was going to do. I tried to take a couple of days away where it's just me. <clears throat> where it was just me. My Bible and the Lord and the events and circumstances of life had gotten so busy. The church, something had happened and I couldn't get away. And I felt like I needed to be here. Who was I trusting in that? You can't survive without me. I'm glad I know that's not true. But I wasn't acting like I knew that wasn't true. So, that morning, as that wave rushes over me and that desire, I knew I had to go. (laughs) Sorry. And so I did. I set it up, I talked to Amy. Oh, now something's in my eye. I talked to Amy. I think she probably wanted me to go as much as I knew I needed to go. Um, and I went. It was my Bible and me in a little sparse room out at the Abbey in, I can't remember, Ava or Aurora or something. Yeah, yeah. 
for two days, and I read the Psalms, and I prayed the Psalms. Whew. I can't tell you. No, no light shined out of the ceiling. No aura filled the room. But peace filled my heart. I'm not oversimplifying this. And I'm not saying I haven't struggled at times since then. I'm not saying I haven't had to go back to those places. But I'm telling you, in Him and by peace, we can find, or in Him, in prayer, we can find peace. I'm not going to ask you to test me. I'm going to ask you to trust the Lord. And if you're struggling, I'm not saying drop your meds and start praying. I'm saying wherever you're at today, you start finding him in his word and in prayer and find peace, which is the promise that comes next. It's verse 7. <clears throat> and the peace. So let me get the context. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, just don't be anxious about anything in everything, right? This has been over and over. Rejoice always. There's this broad universal perspective. Perspective. Always rejoice in the Lord. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone in everything. Don't be anxious, but pray. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding... All understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, even when it doesn't make sense. When the, di- when the pit is deep and the night is dark, pray. Plead with Him. Find Him. Seek Him. Call on Him. Look to Him. And the promise is the Lord will guard you with His peace. In the Lord we are guarded by the God of peace so we can always be at peace even when it doesn't make sense. When it surpasses any ability to describe it or explain it or define it. I can't tell you the troubles were the same when I came back a few days later to the church. The troubles were still there, but my heart was not in the same place as it was before. Now, I I, I realize this. It's something I've I've grown to understand in the the time that I've been a Christian. He, He has all the ability in the world to affect circumstances, to change circumstances. If God wants, the sun stops. If God so desires, the night won't come, right? He is the one who rules over day and night, light and dark. If God desires, the rain will fall. If God desires, the rain won't come. He has every ability to affect every circumstance. But He doesn't make circumstances always work out to the way we think they should. But instead, He conforms our heart to His glory and goodness in the midst of even the most difficult seasons. God is in the business of transforming hearts to trust Him, know Him, follow Him, depend on Him, and be fed by Him. Not being a genie in a bottle that makes things the way we wish they were. It's in seeking Him that we find peace. Not getting the set of circumstances that we so desire. Even when it doesn't make sense, we pray with gratitude, with thanksgiving, rejoicing. And the Lord will guard us with His peace. And where does He guard us? In our hearts and in our minds. The world may be falling down around us, but the inner man, the inner woman can stand and experience the joy of knowing Jesus and the peace that comes with being called His. So in everything, at all times and in every way, rejoice. Don't be anxious. And pray. And be guarded in every season beyond your own understanding by His peace. Let's pray.